Good to see you on this day yeah. where we're talking about traitors and insurrections and such. Yeah. Um, I've actually studied Wilmington uh, quite a lot because during the actual January 6th insurrection, it was like, oh, when has this happened before? Yeah. Tell us, tell us how you were introduced. And it's ironic that you're here today because I had no idea there was going to be a hearing. It was going to be this talk. And so I'm, I'm also, I feel like the ancestors are at play. Yeah. And um, how, how were you inter- introduced to what happened in Wilmington? Um, I went to high school and college in North Carolina, and I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't know anything about it. It wasn't taught in college or high school, and I didn't know about it until 1998 when they had the centennial observation in Wilmington. I started reading about it in newspaper accounts, and I was just astonished that I could be so ignorant about such an important event in our history. And secondly, I was appalled uh, that something like that could happen in the United States of America. So I decided I wanted to correct the historical record, first of all, because uh, it had been twisted and buried. And secondly, I just wanted to bring this important event uh, to the attention of of a broader audience. So that's why I decided that that book needed to be written. I'm having a difficult conversation today because... um... You know, we're, we're playing a bunch of clips from the four officers who put their lives on the line, literally, uh, to beat back a, I call them a horde of yeah. terrorists frothing at the mouth. And I'm struggling today because one of the officers said, you know, somebody looked at him and said, you're not American after they saw his brown skin, Sergeant uh, Aquilino Gunnell. And I'm thinking even about myself today, like, what does it mean to be an American? And I'm looking at you, David Zucchino, with your beautiful white hat, your beautiful white beard and white shirt. And I'm thinking, you know, for you, why should you care, right? Why should you care? Tell me why this matters. I care about fairness and justice, which is uh, one of the reasons I wrote an earlier book uh, that I wrote. Um, I don't believe our country has lived up to our principles all the time. In fact, not very often. Uh, When I see injustice and unfairness, I wanna do something about it. And in the case of this Wilmington story, uh, the white perpetrators of the coup and the murders rewrote history and got away with it. And then they buried history and got away with that. And that makes me angry. Uh, And what really, really made me furious was the fact that nobody was ever punished uh, for the murders of more than 60 black men and for overthrowing a multiracial government by force that our country let that happen, that uh, the president of the United States, Congress, the state government, everyone just shrugged and let it happen. And by letting these white supremacists get away with it, they sent a very clear message to white supremacists everywhere, particularly in the South, that listen, you can murder black men with impunity, you can overthrow a government, you can make sure that black men never vote again or never hold public office again, and you will get away with it. And that message resonated pretty clearly throughout the South after 1898, as you can see in the voter suppression efforts and in the violence uh, perpetrated by the Klan and others, by the attempts in other Southern states to to pass uh, uh, literacy tests and poll taxes and other means to keep black Americans from voting. So this event, had a pretty widespread effect on our country's history and and nobody knows about it and it made me angry david zucchino the book is called wilmington's lie all right so take us back to 1898 in wilmington north carolina wilmington was just a fascinating city it was an unusual city at the time in 1898 it was the only large American city, a uh, city in the South that had a, an African American majority. It was 56% black, but more importantly, it had black men in positions of authority. Three of the 10 city councilmen were black men. 10 of the 26 policemen were black men. You had black magistrates who passed sentence on white defendants. The uh, county treasurer, the county coroner, the county jailer, all of these were black men. At the same time, you had a thriving black middle class of black artisans and black shopkeepers uh, and at least 65 black professionals, doctors, 
lawyers, uh, professors and teachers, almost all of them uh, educated at uh, historically black colleges. I don't know what they were called back then. Um, but you had this sort of a shining example of multiracial government. And in fact, Wilmington was unusual also that in housing, it wasn't completely segregated. There was some integrated neighborhoods, which was unheard of in the South at that time. But all of this was more than the white supremacists could bear. And white supremacists had been ruling Wilmington since well before the Civil War, during slavery. After the Civil War, they survived uh, Reconstruction through the re so-called Redeemer movement. They redeemed the South for white supremacy. And they were in control. And it shocked them that there was an election a fair election in which black men voted and succeeded in uh, being elected to public office. And they decided they weren't gonna live with that, the, the white supremacists did. They announced in the spring of uh, 1898, leading up to the uh, midterm election in the fall, that they were gonna win the election by the ballot or the bullet. In other words, they were gonna cheat and they were gonna use violence. They said they were gonna do that. They also said they were gonna overthrow what they called Negro rule and Negro domination. Those are the terms they used. Um, they told the whole world that and they ended up doing it. And what was interesting by making that announcement, the entire national press came down and spent the summer in Wilmington and was reporting on quote, the race war in North Carolina and I was stunned when doing the research, I assumed at least some of the Northern newspapers would at least have some empathy for African-Americans and the way they were being treated, but they all swallowed the white supremacist line to a man. So the story the country got was the white story that there was a plot by black men to collect weapons, overthrow the white government, overthrow whites, kill them all and take over the city, which was a complete lie, but uh, these reported believe and that's the story that America heard. Propaganda is powerful. Uh, I started is. off the show talking about uh, 1933 in Germany uh, with Hin Hil um, Hindenburg and Hitler right. and how we cannot be complicit or you know play footsies with folk who are willing to do anything by any means necessary to maintain power. Again, I'm going to ask you one more time, David Zucchino, because, you know, uh, there are a lot of people that ride with the lie because it's beneficial, right? It's right. beneficial to you, your children, your grandchildren, your progeny. It is uh, the lie upon which this country was built, right? That some yeah. these people are inferior. That's why we have to enslave them. We're going to make them good Christians. We're going to civilize them. They're savages. They're cannibals. Right. Oh, don't tell anybody they gave us math, science and all the things that we Oh, don't, don't tell anybody they actually built the country. Don't tell anybody that they're inferior, they're children, they're not worthy of anything. But why do we make it illegal for them to read if they're so inferior? So Because they shouldn't be able to, right? Anyway, exactly. how what, what was the awakening? What was your road to Damascus that allowed you to say, hey, this happened? Not, I see you're a good guy. See that you, you care about injustice. But what was the wake up call? The unfairness of it. I know, but when did when, what was the, that moment where you discovered it? Where were you at the time? Were you in a library? Who told you the oh, story? Oh, I when I heard about this story, I was reading newspaper accounts. I was at home just reading the newspaper and came across accounts of what happened, and and I was just appalled and embarrassed that I didn't I didn't know about this. I mean, that's that was my moment, and it was in 1998. Okay, eight six six eight zero one eight two five five. So now you know you you have this book, Wilmington's Lie. It's powerful. Uh, it, it lays out the account. I, and I, and I apologize because today I'm very not optimistic about the future of this country. I feel very sad about what I see is an inflection point uh, in a demise of our democracy. I'm unsure what to do about it. I think truth is important. I think we must keep beating the drum of history and facts and getting people in front of them. But I'm not optimistic. Are you optimistic, David Zucchino, that things no. are gonna change? No. I stopped being optimistic when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. Uh, and then I, I got completely uh, depressed after January 6th. But beyond that, in the attempts by Republican legislatures around the country to suppress the vote and specifically target African-Americans and making it as difficult as possible for them to vote. And it's particularly here in North Carolina. 
where, believe it or not, 122 years ago, um, the, the Democratic Party, which then was the party of white supremacy, their delegation to the state legislature in North Carolina was 100% white. Well, believe it or not, today, 120 years later, the Republican delegation to the North Carolina legislature is 100% white. So we haven't come anywhere. And they are fighting as hard as they can to eliminate the African-American vote. They are trying every which way through gerrymandering, through voter ID laws, um, through, and, and in fact, the federal courts keep throwing out every attempt that they make. I don't know if you recall when they passed their first voter ID bill, um, it was challenged by the NAACP and other groups and the federal courts struck it down saying that white Republicans had targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. And they went step by step and showed how the Republicans found out, you know, how many black people had driver's licenses, how many voted on souls to polls, how many used early voting, everything that they did, they took it away. And that was thrown out, but they keep trying, they keep coming back with more. The same on gerrymandering. They've tried several gerrymandering schemes where they try to pack African Americans into uh, a couple of districts, we'll give you those districts and then we'll take all the rest because it'll be full of white conservatives. The same thing, the federal courts threw it out and said, uh, one judge said that race was the primary concern of the legislature and these are uh, unconstitutional racial gerrymanders in violation of the 14th amendment. They throw them out and then they try more and they get thrown out, but they don't give up, they're still trying. Solutions. Um... Because uh, you know, I'm I have, I'm telling everyone get your passport. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make sure make sure you have an exit strategy. Have your go bag ready because yeah. you know when it turns, it turns quickly. Um, uh, people don't realize how quickly because it's already in motion, right? There's already right. a plan in motion. January sixth didn't happen on January sixth. It was three, four years of planning, but probably even more than that. You know, yeah. we we'll probably go back to Obama and you know uh what the Republicans were willing to do then uh, in the Tea Party what kind of solutions or, or methods or strategy or tactics can can we deploy over the next year? Because uh, I think 2022, if, if the Republicans take the House and the Senate, Oof. it's a wrap. 2024, yeah. it's a wrap. Yeah. What are your thoughts about I how we come two words. This? Two words, Stacey Abrams. Everybody oh. needs to be Stacey oh, Abrams. Everybody needs to get involved and fight it, uh, you know, at the grassroots. And that's what she's doing. And she's mobilizing people and she's fighting. And every state has a fight on their hands, just about every state uh, where Republicans are trying to do this. And that's the only way to stop them is to confront them and challenge them and embarrass them. I mean, they're beyond shame, but at least you can try. So uh, if, if I had a solution, that would be it. David Zucchino, Z Zucchino um, first of all, thank you for doing this book because we need people who care uh, out there beating this drum. Uh, the book is called Wilmington's Lie. I suggest people read it and understand no one should be ignorant about what happened because it is, history is important. It tells you what can happen. So we're here now. We're literally living in a space where we saw an insurrection January 6th. Um, traders that now people are calling tourists um so it's so weird and i don't know you know you you've seen like you've lived a, a while on this earth um yeah i'm up there uh then i'm not you know indicting you for that but i'm saying your experience has shown you you know the, the 70s you know it was hopeful and you know free love and people were coming together around this notion of war should we be going across this water killing other people and there was a whole movement there feeding people hunger you know that was an right. issue poor poverty there was a poverty movement anti-poverty movement and then it all came to a crashing halt you know under reagan uh and then it was a crack epidemic and we got distracted i feel like the summer of george floyd gave us some indication that people are willing to take to the streets because we had time in a pandemic uh that sat us home but i think we can get our eye off the ball so quickly um some insight, sir, into that in, in terms of not just putting everything on Stacey Abrams and mobilizing, but right. just as a community of, of people, of human beings, that folk are willing to do this to other human beings for power's sake. What are they really fighting for? Because it's, it's strange to me. What are the police fighting for or what are we No, fighting? not the police. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the people who think that they're fighting to preserve their whiteness. They are... <laughs> They're fighting to preserve their privilege 
And what they believe, and they pretty much come out and say it, is that America is a white Christian country and all these other people who don't look like us and aren't Christians like us, us white people, um, aren't real Americans. And they don't deserve the right to vote. And if they do vote, they cheat. And that's what Donald Trump told his followers uh, on January 6th, that if you want your country back, you better fight for it. And that's what the, uh, the leaders in uh, 1898, they told their followers in newspapers and speeches, if you read the book, you'll see it, that we are fighting for our very survival, our way of life, and our way of life, of course, is dominating people of color and making them servile and having them serve us. And if we don't resort to violence, and if you don't go out and get your guns, there's going to be, quote, Negro domination. And I see that, that same theme from Trump and all the rest of the Republicans now. They talk about replacement theory. On Fox News, that's all you hear is this, you know, America is white and Christian, and that's the way it should be. But all these other people are coming in and are going to change the very face of our nation. Uh, you can start with immigrants, all these Hispanic people. Uh, what about all these Muslims? Uh, what about all these Black Lives Matter people? Uh, these people are a threat to your way of life. That's the message that's out there. And, and it, it's not subtle. It's, it's very direct. And that's, and what really fits in nicely is the whole, uh, the gun debate or lack of debate on guns where Republicans want as many white folks as possible to have as many guns and as much ammunition as possible uh, because they tell their followers that these Black Lives Matter people are thugs and they're going to come into your neighborhood. I don't know if you saw the, the commercial. It was a Republican commercial during the 2020 campaign. It showed a white lady sitting at home. She hears a noise and it looks like somebody's breaking in. She calls 911 and guess what? Oh, they defunded the police. Nobody can come help you now. And the clear implication was it didn't show who's breaking in, but obviously it was a black person. And I think that was an incredibly effective ad. I bet you it terrified thousands of white people to vote Republican. Um, so the message is fear. The message is grievance. The message is this is your country and they're taking it away from you. 